uh, three, three and a half to four million EBITDA. And when you guys go to buy these businesses, what type of multiple, of course, it depends on industry and it's very yeah. dependent, but what's the range? Is it 1X, 2X, 3X, 4X? Is that, li- is that the sweet spot of kind of the bulk of your deals? Yeah, I would say kind of three and a half to five and a half would kind of be the be a normal range. Um, right. I mean, we maybe we'd go higher for a really high quality asset, but I would say that's a pretty normal range in our segment, which is, you know, kind of our strike zone is three to $8 million of owner earnings. Um, so in that range, I mean, on the upper end, you can get into more traditional private equity territory and, and um, you can see some, some, well, you used to see as of three weeks ago, this is again, I got to reorientate myself to the new reality, but um, um, yeah, I would say three and a half to five and a half times. And then there's usually a component of that that's held back, uh, earned out or downside protected in some way. Right. So we're typically paying two to um, kind of two to three and a half times cash at close. And then the rest kind of on, on the upside, depending on what happens. Gotcha. So you might have a, let's say $10 million price tag uh, for the cash at close and then plus maybe 4 million, 3 million bucks uh, yeah. that's, that's earned out. So now you go to SBA and what you were saying is that you guys don't do Debt. You, go, you guys do no debt or you uh, use less debt than a, per, uh, a typical private equity firm? Yeah. So, so the SBA was on the first transaction I did. Oh, 10 you don't do SBA. My own money that we have no, we have no involvement with banks uh, or the SBA or anything like that now. So um, you guys just do cash deals. You say, here's 10 million bucks. Uh, yep. We're done. And why don't you use debt? Yeah, well, so um, debt's one way to take a good company, make it a, a fragile company. Um, you know, d- the more debt you're layering on and the um, sort of the wider the variation of outcomes that you expect to happen. Um, and obviously, pandemic risk is something that was not on a lot of people's radars, us included, uh, until recently. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a good example of why we think that um, not levering these companies, especially in the beginning when you're starting to get to know them. Uh, I mean, until you own these companies, you just don't know what you're getting really until you get, you know, underneath the hood and there's always more risk there than you think there will be. Right. So, um, you know, our, our mentality has been go in with, with all equity, no debt, um, try to keep them very, very, uh, robust, uh, on the balance sheet and make sure, and we're buying these with full balance sheets attached to them. Right. So working capital is all included. So the net worth of the company will be, um, you know, fairly robust going into the transaction. And then of course, as we, over time, as we build cash into these companies, um, then we can decide what to do with it. Um, but working capital bucket is kind of like the, you got to fill up the bucket first right. before the owners can get anything out, right? Cause you got to keep the, the, the machinery lubricated. And when you buy a company, what is the first three months, six months? Are you hands-on with that? Is it, uh, do you have, do you have an operating partner who does that? How do you guys make sure that you, when you buy an asset, you don't, yeah. A, destabilize it, and B, you actually start to grow it, which is, I assume, why you bought it in the first place. Yeah, so so our, our philosophy, there's a lot of uh, private equity firms out there that have these like, you know, 30-day, 90-day, 120-day plans, right? Um, we don't do that. Um, what we try to do is, is take a humble attitude towards it and say, look, we, we, we know some things, we have some talents, but, but we want to learn and, and, and uh, come alongside them. They're the experts. They've been doing it for a long time. Um, so there's a team of 16 of us. So so it's not certainly, if I don't want to give the impression, this is just me. Um, there's people far talented, more talented than I am on staff. Um, and they're, um, we, we have a dual hook in structure post-close. So our financial team hooks into their financial team and creates feedback loops. And then we have a, um, a we call it a portfolio partner. They're kind of a board of directors in a box that um, uh, is overseeing kind of the executive leadership, um, helping make very high level decisions. Um, I mean, these are autonomous operating units. I mean, so there's, these are, these are not, we're not injecting these people into the companies to run them, but they're in touch with the leadership teams all the time, um, doing, you know, a variety of different types of, uh, calls and meetings throughout the year. Um, And how many companies are there? There's nine. Um, that you guys own. Yeah. Got it. So that seems manageable. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, so for every kind of three to five companies we, we acquire, we got to hire one high level financial person and one portfolio partner. Um, and that's kind of their, their grouping of companies that they're kind of running. So we're almost creating like a fractal, if you want to think about it that way, down into the organization so that it scales as sort of linearly in that way. So Andrew from Tiny, uh, Sean and I are friends with him and we, I just shoot the shit with him every once in a while. And he emailed me he like tweeted this thing and he sent me the tweet of how he saw, met a guy who had a cool furniture store and he goes, Oh, this is neat. You need to put that on Shopify. And okay, I'll partner with you. Let's do it. Now I own part of it. And he also did the same thing with like a local news outlet in Victoria where he just like, seems like he's spinning up stuff so fast. I'm like, Andrew, I don't know how you track all this. This is crazy. Sure. Uh, tracking nine is easier than 
tracking nine is hard, but it's a little simpler because it appears from the outside as though he has got 40 different things. Sure. Uh, how does how does that compare? Do you think with with something like Tiny uh, and does 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 keeping it on top of all this? I mean, uh, that seems really hard to focus on where to put your focus. Yeah, I, I mean, I I know Andrew a little bit. I, I don't know him super well. I mean, it seems like he's been successful. Um, I think they're getting involved in 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 for the most part more internet based uh, software based yeah. type companies. Um, so it's just a very different model. Um, uh, so I would say. Um, I have no idea how they're organized internally. I can tell you on our end, um, is it a lot of work? Is it difficult? Of course it is, right? Um, anything worthwhile is going to be hard. Um, you know, internally, how we've created that structure, though, it's, it, it, it creates a very manageable um, focus group, right? So you can, you can allow uh, a small group of people to be highly focused on, on certain outcomes as opposed to being all over the place. I mean, I, if it was just me and a partner of mine, like that we were trying to ham and egg this thing, like I'd go nuts. There's no way, especially right now. I mean, with all the turmoil that's happening, um, there's just no way you can keep everything separate and, you know, watch legislation that's coming out and watch legal and accounting and meet deadlines for audits. And I mean, it's, it takes a full team. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we're obviously blessed to have that. Earlier, you talked about the, one of the things you buy a company. I, you, you, okay, so you said that there's, there, your sweet spot is in between like it working out, like it, it working and it being professionalized, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that when I, so uh, I started, the company that I have, uh, I started when I was 24. It's, it's a good business now. But what I learned the hard way was that actually to make something more valuable, you need to take yourself out of the equation as opposed to like, you know, this Mark Zuckerberg thing where you're just going to super Superman this thing into like existence. It's actually far more valuable, even if that means you have a lower revenue number to have it where it's like a machine where people can be, uh, where you have put people in place and it's not just on the shoulders of one person. Sure. Um, can you, and, and I learned this from David Hauser. Sean, you know David Hauser? I don't. Okay, this guy named David Hauser, he's one of our little, he's, we, we've raised a little bit of money. He's one of our investors. He started Grasshopper, which it was like, a, yeah. you know, Grasshopper? Okay, he started yeah, that. Course. Okay, so it, it helps entrepreneurs. It, it gives small businesses a, a, a phone. So it's like Google Voice on steroids. And he sold it for, I think, $300 million. Really successful. And he wasn't the, even the CEO. He started it and owned the company and hired a CEO yeah. to run it. And he taught me how to do that. And I think that's fascinating. Can you talk, but, but that's different than what of our, a lot of our listeners probably think about. They think about if they're going to start it, they got to be like running the show. Can you talk about where you've learned this process and, and why, and, and, and I guess the companies who you've bought, how have they successfully navigated that to where the owner is no longer like the person? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, for, for us, I mean, well, one, I, I knew my own limitations. I knew that there was no way that uh, I could just brute force this thing on my own. And I mean, uh, I think always subscribe to the uh, bring, bring people that are far smarter and more driven around you. Um, so that's how we build the organization. Um, I, I hope in three to five years, I'm completely useless and they just give me my ball of yarn and let me play with it. Um, so, um, but in, in the organizations that we look at, um, we, we call this founder remote. So this is probably the biggest danger of, of acquisitions is you buy a company that is that largely all of the goodwill is tied up in the relationships, expertise, drive of the founder. Um, and there's just no really way to transition those uh, separate from maybe coming alongside them and, and over a very long period of time um, making that transition happen. So I, for us, we try to select against that. Uh, we wanna see repeatable processes. We wanna see a, a healthy layer of non-owner management. Um, we want to be able to see that um, we always call it, you know, hit by a bus risk. Um, so if anybody in the organization can get by a bus and destroy the value of the business, um, that's just a no go for us. But tell um, me what you've learned on these people. So how do I, I want to make my company like that? How have you, yeah. got, what, what have, who, how have they done it best? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that the methodology that we've seen work the best is um, take the things that either you aren't good at or you don't want to do and start giving them to other people. And then at, over time, as you sort of continue to offload and offload and offload, you just kind of move up until eventually there's nothing much for you to really be working on. I mean, if you have a lot of free time and you have a lot of flexibility, um, we always talk about if you have the optionality to get involved or not to get involved, a lot of these owners, you being a good example of that, could probably add a lot of value if you chose to get involved, but you also know that the thing's going to work out fine if you don't get involved. 
Um, and so that's always ultimately the test. Now, um, we also have a lot of owners that we talk to and they say, oh, I'm not needed in the office at all. I, you know, this thing runs itself. And we say to them, oh, that's great. When was the last time you took a vacation? They're like, oh, I think three years ago, I went on a weekend getaway with my wife. And uh, yeah, you know, and you're like, really? Uh, so there's that balancing act of self-awareness as well. Is there any resources that you turn to or have turned to to learn this or that you can tell me and our audience to uh, turn to in order to learn how to do this successfully? Gosh, I, I don't. Um, it's more just, you know, getting hit in the face over and over again. Um, the hard knocks. And Brent, where are you finding these companies? So are, are you, is it a broker network? Are you, are there websites you use? Is it inbound because you do a lot of content or, you know, what is the, explain how you find the companies that you end up looking into and potentially buying. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we're fortunate now um, we do a lot of content out there. Actually, podcast is one of the things that, that's been helpful for us. Um, so thank you guys for having me on. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, we have, it's all inbound at this point. So we're not going outbound to anybody. By the way, the website. Oh, there you go. I you're, got you're, your book. If you're listening to the audio version, which you almost certainly are, uh, I'm holding up the messy marketplace, which is Brent's book. I bought this like, I don't know, six months ago. Uh, I bought it right after we sold our business. So it wasn't really uh, applicable. I was kind of like, Oh, what did I do wrong type of thing? Um, but, <laughs> I'm sure you'd be fine. Uh, uh, yeah. It turns out just timing was good. Uh, uh, you know, getting in before the whole world descended into chaos was, it was a good idea, a good time to sell, but I didn't know that. Uh, but you put out this book and um, it seems like you do more content than, than I would say the typical kind of buyer or private equity firm. Yeah. I mean, I, so, so, uh, you know, I owe most of my career to just ripping off venture capital, um, is, is in, in reality. Um, so you just look at how did all the, you know, Fred Wilson's, Brad Feld's, uh, Schuster's, uh, Andreessen, all those guys, how did they break into the world? And it was basically by pulling back the curtain and, um, ed helping educate people. Um, and, uh, so, I mean, that's what we've, we've taken that, that to heart and we've, I mean, started very early on. So we've been producing, boy, producing content, talking to people for probably seven or eight years now. Um, it's gone back a long time. And so, um, yeah, over time that compounds, right? In the beginning, you're just shouting into the darkness and no one cares. And then over time, you know, you sort of get people's attention. Um, our goal is just to be the first stop uh, for anybody who wants to sell their business. And um, we also try to be helpful on the back end. So it, all of it's inbound. We have a scout network, um, which is common in Silicon Valley, uh, but very uncommon in, in private equity. Um, so we have about 700 people now that, uh, that scout opportunities for us, um, which is fantastic. Um, and we obviously pay them um, when, when we uh, are able to consummate the transaction. And you have a uh, capital camp, right? Yeah, yeah. So Patrick and I... Uh, yeah, so we, uh, we, we were complaining one night uh, about how all the events and finance were terrible and uh, how it'd be fun to get like a cross section of people together. Because there's typically, you know, VC events, private equity events, there's very few events that get sort of a broad cross section of people doing interesting things together. And so uh, we complained about it enough. I, I, I said to Patrick, I said, well, why don't we just do something about it? And so he and I partnered up and uh, we hosted the first one last year it was fantastic. Uh, about 250 people from 11 countries, uh, five continents came in. And um, that was great. Uh, we, had, we had a wonderful time. Hosted in Columbia, Missouri, my backyard. Um, but it was, you know, I think I, there was one other guy from Missouri there. So it was very, uh, <laughs> not, not a regional crowd, if you, if you know what I'm saying. Um, and unfortunately, this year, we had to postpone it um, due to the virus. So um, we're pushing it to September. Hopefully that uh, we are able to flatten enough by then that uh, we, can, uh, we can have it hosted then. Give us some predictions about the virus and the, the way the sort of What's happening to businesses right now? You know, on one hand, uh, you said your timing was was good in the sense that you raised your big fund before all this, and now yeah. a bunch of businesses are going to need liquidity. They're going to need, um, you know, somebody who's who's a stable capital partner to to come in and buy them. Um, what are you guys seeing? What's your prediction on on how this is going to play out? Well, Both for, uh, for you and for the economy, I would say. Yeah. Well, well, so so for uh, well, let me let me so broader. I think what what we're predicting, and of course, no one has any idea, right? We're I mean, trying to do the best we can to triangulate information. Um, we think it's going to be a pretty long, uh, if you want to think about it, a good analogy I heard was, uh, is a blizzard, a winter, or an ice age, right? It's kind of a, the three stages, probably. Um, you know, I think the blizzard is going to last for another at least six to eight weeks, um, probably longer than that. Um, and then I think we're going through a period of, uh, it's going to be hard to restart a lot of these businesses. So there's uh, in, in theory, it sounds, oh, there's economic problems. It's no big deal. You just kind of go into hibernation and come back out of it and everything's fine, right? Uh, in practice, there's a lot of start-stop problems. I mean, you guys have run businesses, you know, if you had to mothball 
uh, everything and try to restart it, I mean, you're, you're not gonna be able to do it, uh, or at least be very difficult to do it. Um, and so um, I, my guess is there's gonna be a lot of pain and suffering. Um, so in our portfolio, um, you know, because we don't use debt, we have good balance sheets, and obviously we have a financial firm to back it up. Um, I, you know, we're gonna be fine. I mean, a lot of the businesses we're involved in have been doing better than we expected uh, probably two weeks ago. Um, but with that said, you just have no idea where demand's going to go. And I mean, we're bracing and we have plans for, you know, depending on what level of pain and suffering, um, you know, happens, what, you know, what the plan is. And, you know, we're going to try to get the things back up and running as fast as we possibly can. Um, you know, the government intervention that just came out uh, is interesting in how it's structured. So the CARE Act just got passed, I don't know, like 20, 30 minutes ago. Um, and, um, you know, it is... Uh, it's better than nothing. Uh, it, it's going through the SBA and the SBA is, um, to be generous, like the DMV of the finance world. And so um, it's not gonna be an easy uh, thing to get all that money deployed. Um, also the, the SBA lenders that we're talking to that are at these banks, I mean, we're not using the SBA, but obviously if it's uh, forgivable loans, then it'd be insane for us not to, to participate in that. Um, and they don't even know what the rules are, right? And so they're trying to get triangulated on, on what things are. Um, so I think there's gonna be a lot of confusion. I think it's gonna take a lot of time to get the, the money into people's hands. I'm not sure it's gonna actually stem the tide as much as they think it will on unemployment. And so I fear that unemployment could go to 20, 25, maybe even 30%, which is- Do you think that's realistic? Yeah. Yeah. Fucking A, man, that's crazy. Yeah. To put that um, in perspective, to put that in perspective, the Great, de uh, de the, the great Depression was what, 18 or 20? It, I think it, it touched high 20s. Okay. Um, so, so, I mean, at the peak, and, and like I said, I mean, I, look, I hope I'm wrong, <laughs> right? Let's sure. just say it for what it is. I mean, I, I hope that that's not, that this is not a good environment for us, actually. I mean, this is an interesting, we could talk about it as being a, uh, you know, a firm that has a lot of cash right now. Um, I, I don't think this is a good environment for us at all. I would much prefer a 2008, which was much more shallow uh, downturn recession, Um this the violence of this is is basically rendering all information uh, available um, like a non-issue. You just can't. There's nothing predictive about what's happened in the past and what how it goes in the future. And demand curves. I mean, we don't. No one knows. No one knows what the demand curve looks but like. But are you betting for a twenty percent or thirty percent unemployment rate? Well, I'm not betting on it. Uh, that's why I think's going to happen. Um, but I, I think you said you think that's going to happen. I think I think we'll probably touch twenty percent. Um, I think we could touch thirty percent. Um, yeah, and I think we'll see it in the next six weeks. Um, will be will be when it really comes down. My guess is I, I called jobs the the jobs number the, the unemployment number that came out. I had said uh, previously I thought it was going to be about three point five. It ended up being about three point three. Um, which was wildly higher than what the sort of consensus was a million. And if, look, if you're involved in small businesses and you said there was a million people uh, filing for unemployment, like I said, that's like a joke. Um, of course, it was going to be way higher than that. There's no way it couldn't be way higher than that. And I mean, what we're seeing is, I mean, I, I had a buddy this week who laid off um, uh, 4,000 to 5,000 employees this week. I had another friend who laid off uh, 585 of 600. Um, I mean, and this is, that's just me. I mean, what I know. Were they of, in right? the hotel industry or what, what was it just but the one industry of, that? Yeah. Food services one. Um, and, um, uh, construction was the other. Um, yeah. so it's just, it's, it's, it's a tough, I mean. And why do you say this is, uh, this is not a good time versus 2008? What's, what is the core difference there? Yeah. So the, the core difference is the violence at which this had, has, has downturned um, is, is basically, you could see in 2008, a nice trend, right? Line, like you could see it's kind of like a soft, you know, in private businesses, right? I'm not going to talk about the stock market, stock market and private businesses are totally different. Right. But in, in the stock market, it was, you know, sort of had a violence to it and then, you know, kind of petered out and then had another violence to it. Um, I mean, this happened in, in fucking eight days. Right, right. I mean, obviously Lehman and, and all that stuff come crashing. Oh, down. no, I'm talking about right now. Oh, but yeah, right now. That's what I'm saying is right now in, in private businesses, it, it is worse in private businesses than it's reflected in the stock market right now. Right. Um, I mean, it's hard to know what's priced in and, and what do you do with monetary policy when you have basically an unlimited bid? I, I don't know, right? But I mean, when you look at it from the businesses that we interact with, it's carnage everywhere. I mean, you maybe have, I would say 90% of businesses have been adversely affected 5% are probably, you know, sort of unaffected. And then maybe 5% have some sort of tailwind that's weird because of this. Um, but 90% are just, it is suffering. I mean, I, it is unbelievable what's happening right now. Mm -hmm.